very much I've loved you. How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. made our life impossible. There's no way to detach ourselves from what's happened today. And we, we are sitting here waiting on a powder cake. I don't think this is what we want to do with our babies. I don't think that's what we had in mind to do with our babies. It was said by the greatest of prophets from time immemorial, no man lay, takes my life from me, I lay my life down. If we can't live in peace, then let's die in peace. With the echoes of the Summer of Love still resonating through its streets, the entrance to the 1970s symbolized the beginning of a new era for San Francisco. The social and political changes engulfing the country were particularly noticeable in the city known as the Fog City. As a witness to a fervent struggle for civil rights, San Francisco became one of the epicenters of progressive political activity. At a time when social inequalities persisted, and African Americans continued to be victims of structural racial discrimination. The city became a focal point for activist movements. Many organizations raised their voices to fight for racial equality and economic justice, but none had as rapid and profound an impact as a community that suddenly settled in the city. A temple for the people had arrived in San Francisco. In the spring of 1972, the city's major media outlets reported that a religious organization had moved its headquarters to San Francisco. A community of about 5,000 members had mobilized from the small town of Redwood Valley, led by a charismatic preacher. Jim Jones was the founder of what he called the People's Temple. Apparently, at just 25 years old, he had established the first integrated church in Indiana, expressing a deep rejection of the country's structural racism. He invited all those who had felt discriminated against to be part of a safe place, a community where everyone was treated equally regardless of their skin color. With this message, Jones became a role model for the African American community in Indianapolis. The People's Temple, professing these progressive ideas, grew steadily, eventually seeking a place to establish itself in California. This path had finally led them to San Francisco, where they dreamed of creating their main headquarters. Congregants spoke highly of the community they had collectively built, professing a message that quickly resonated with citizens who, like them in the past, felt like they didn't fit in. The fame of the people's temple grew exponentially, and the figure of its spiritual leader was becoming a phenomenon. Within months, the church was known throughout San Francisco. Jim Jones, already treated in the media as a celebrity, was donating money and participating in countless social causes. This immediate impact led him to find his place in politics, gaining support from politicians and important figures in the city. The Reverend and his temple had become the symbol of the fight for human rights. The visible face of this new era for the country. However, amid the fervor for the city's new idol, Marshall Kilduff, a journalist for the San Francisco Chronicle covering the People's Temple events, began to notice things that didn't add up. The followers of the community glorified Jim Jones in an unusual way. It was not typical for someone considered a religious figure, a spiritual guide, to display airs of grandiosity, giving an image of being majestic, blindly praised by his followers. 
Perhaps it was only his impressions, but he believed there was something dark about that man. Moved by his intuition, Marshall tried to talk to members of the community, but far from resolving his doubts, his concerns grew. Each and every one of them repeated the same speech. The people's temple was their life, and Jim Jones was the man guiding them to happiness, referring to him as the father. The leader they would follow to the end of the world. With all the worst premonitions growing, he understood that he would find no answers within the church. Only through the people who had left that community. Those who had departed from Jim Jones' path. After an exhaustive investigation, he was able to contact three former members of the community. Grace Stowen, Jean, and Al Mills were interviewed. And from the very beginning, they all said that many things were happening inside that people were not aware of. Jones was deeply poisoned by a thirst for power, they claimed. And he had turned that community into a dark place. The People's Temple had long been a cult that suppressed any individual freedom. Once you entered it, there was no escape. They themselves had witnessed beatings of those Jones considered traitors. Threats to the integrity of the empire he was building around his figure. There had been death threats to members who had expressed their intentions to leave the congregation. Jones expected his followers to renounce their individuality, believing that all material possessions made them slaves to the system. Only by having nothing would they be truly free. Trusting in his word, many gave everything to the church, including their homes and all their savings. Living in communes and isolating themselves from external influence, an outside world that pursued them, creating conspiracies to fracture their church. The United States was allegedly planning to put black people in concentration camps, and only he and his temple could protect them from that fate. Through fear, he had trapped them. The idea of us and them had been instilled. Whole families were fractured because, as Jones said, family ties were the most toxic relationships. From now on, their only father, all they needed, was him. Gradually, he had managed to surround himself with an aura of divinity, transcending the boundaries of being a mere man for his followers. And so, shortly after arriving in California, healings began. The reason they had fled from that community, Jim Jones promised to heal wounds, reverse disabilities, and even eliminate cancers. Healing sessions at the People's Temple became massive events. Witnesses of these false performances where the supposed magic of the Reverend cured the sick. Congregants no longer doubted that their father was a mere mortal. Healings were the tool to achieve blind belief in him. And to all those who obviously did not heal, he made them believe it was their fault. That they could not be cured because they did not trust him enough or were not as devoted to his church as they should be. It didn't take long before he started referring to himself as a god and wearing dark glasses. Despite using them to hide the emaciated look of his eyes due to drug use, he claimed they were to prevent them from being burned by the divine power emanating from within him. The last thing they had experienced before fleeing from an increasingly dark place was Jim Jones's word of leading his people to what he called the Promised Land. And they knew that those who stayed would follow him wherever necessary, regardless of the end of the path. The three warned Marshall that he had to distance himself from all that, that if Jones found out what he was investigating, his life could be in danger. But he had to do it for all the people still inside, trapped by the faith of a madman. Marshall compiled the anonymous testimonies in an article where he discussed the entire story of Jim Jones and the People's Temple cult, aware of the immediate impact it would have. And his intuition did not fail him. When he published the Chronicle on August 1st, 1977, 
a media storm erupted in the city of San Francisco. The journalist had shown the world the dark side of a man who was a true celebrity in political and social circles. There was not a single person in the city who did not read Marshall's article. All the media outlets in San Francisco sent correspondents to the People's Temple headquarters to continue investigating what was happening inside. Jim Jones's name, within hours, was associated with a sinister cult. But as much as television and newspapers tried to reach him, obtain statements that could initiate legal proceedings against what was already considered a sect, there was no trace of that man. Jim Jones had disappeared, just like the hundreds of members of his community. The People's Temple had vanished into the fog. Unable to locate them, it was again the former members who guided them on that path. Apparently, Jones had known for a long time that eventually the situation of his community would be untenable, that sooner or later what his article had triggered would happen. Therefore, four years earlier in 1973, he began the construction of a settlement in the South American country of Guyana, a nation he had always adored. Jones made a pact with the government of the country, receiving approval to build, in the middle of the jungle, a place he named Jonestown. Far from everything, in the heart of a remote jungle, he erected a village where hundreds of people could live, autonomous and independent of any state. An agricultural community away from violence and discrimination that the chosen ones could populate. A place Jones referred to as the Promised Land. They were convinced that, fearing the collapse of the empire he had raised after the media storm, Jim had ordered an exodus to Jonestown. He and all his followers had hidden in the depths of the jungle, a realm where he would be free to do whatever he pleased. And later, all those intuitions materialized when the relatives of the members received letters from Guyana, all saying that they were happier than ever, that Jonestown was their new home. Jim Jones had completed the exodus to his promised land. Families were terrified, fearing what that man who controlled their minds at will could do with their loved ones in the midst of that jungle. Without laws and without anyone watching over him. However, despite the protests of the relatives, US authorities had no jurisdiction over what was happening in Guyana's territory. At least not until Grace Stowen, who had been interviewed in Marshall's article, formally denounced Jim Jones for the custody of her youngest son whom he had taken to Jonestown. Faced with this situation, the courts could issue an order for repatriation to Guyana, determining that in case Jim Jones did not cooperate, they could proceed with his arrest. The instructions were clear. From the issuance of the statement, he had six days for John Victor, Grace's son, to be on a plane back to the United States. However, when the deadline expired, it was announced that somehow, Jones had convinced the Prime Minister of Guyana to drop all charges against him. Grace's son remained in that place, in the hands of the King of Jonestown. Nevertheless, the mother and the other former members did not give up and began writing letters to Congress, describing the desperate situation they were experiencing. Fortunately, when these letters reached the hands of Congressman Leo Ryan, an official commission initiated an investigation into Jonestown. And from the outset, it was clear that there was only one way. Travel to that promised land. Enter the empire of that cult. Former members warned the delegation of the dangers, that they had never met a man like Jones, and that they were entering his lair, into a realm where he was considered a divine being. The incarnation of God. Ignoring the warnings, on November 14, 1978, Ryan and a team of journalists flew to Georgetown, the capital of Guyana. Once there, they managed to communicate with Jones, 
who, after three days of negotiations and initial refusals, eventually agreed to allow the expedition to visit the village. Thus, on Friday the 17th, the delegation was able to fly over the jungle and hours later, in the middle of nowhere, in the heart of the jungle, see how that place rose. They had arrived in Jonestown. Sirens from a deafening loudspeaker alerted of their arrival. Outsiders in their promised land. As soon as they landed, several people from the village came out to meet them. Ryan told them that they had only come to make sure they were okay, that no American citizen had health problems in that place. Immediately, as if following orders, they conducted a visit through the community. Hundreds of people were living, developing their entire lives, in the middle of a dense jungle. Hundreds of kilometers from any other human community. Isolation was absolute. There was no contact with anyone outside. But everyone they spoke to repeated over and over that they loved Jonestown. That they would not want to return home for anything in the world. That all those rumors that no one could leave were lies that they were free to leave whenever they wanted. But the simplest common sense was enough to understand that without an airplane, no matter how much they wanted, it was impossible to traverse that jungle. There was no freedom. They were trapped in a place that, with every passing minute, became more unsettling for everyone. As night fell, they held a party where despite the music and the apparent joy, there was a tremendously tense atmosphere. Everything was artificial. Like actors in a play, following the script perfectly. And that's when they saw him in the crowd for the first time. Jim Jones was silently observing them. The hours passed and the nervousness persisted. Until suddenly, Ryan felt someone touch his arm. A man had handed him a note and everything definitively exploded when upon separating to read it, he saw what was written on it. A simple phrase. Get us out of Jonestown. They no longer had any doubt. These people were being held against their will. Aware that they couldn't do anything until dawn the next morning, the team began to organize everything. And as news of the note spread throughout the settlement, Stating that the man who had delivered it would return with them to the United States, many others joined him. It felt like everything in Jonestown was collapsing. Just looking at the face of their leader revealed how anger was growing within him. They were taking away his followers, people who had never rebelled against him. They were fleeing from his promised land. Amidst this atmosphere of unbearable tension, the team boarded trucks with the people who wanted to leave Jonestown, heading to the Port Kaituma, where two planes were waiting for them. Crossing a path that seemed endless, the convoy finally reached the airstrip. They were about to leave that place forever. But as passengers were boarding, a tractor from Jonestown appeared from between the trees, settling in the middle of the runway. On board, eight men, all of them armed. Something strange was happening. And before they could react, in the midst of the sepulchral silence in that jungle, everything erupted. A deafening noise. And suddenly, everything went dark. Minutes later, alerted by what they immediately identified as gunfire, Residents of a nearby village traveled to the airstrip, only to find five lifeless bodies, including that of Leo Ryan and dozens of wounded. They had been shot by Jonestown members. News of the massacre at the airport reached the capital of Guyana that same night, triggering a military operation to find those responsible. Army officials traveled to the heart of the jungle reaching the outskirts of the village early in the morning, prepared to attack. Navigating through the jungle fog, aware that gunfire could start at any moment, they finally reached Jonestown. But against all odds, 
all they found there was silence. A silence that sent shivers down the spines of men witnessing something for which no one can be prepared. When the fog cleared, hundreds of corpses revealed themselves. Countless lifeless bodies scattered throughout the settlement, but not a single sign of violence. No trace of weapons. All the people lay intact, many of them embracing. And when they found barrels full of cyanide, there was no doubt. They were facing a methodical ritual of death. The citizens of Jonestown had just committed the largest mass suicide in history. As news of what they had just discovered reached the United States, an unprecedented media whirlwind erupted. The images and videos sent by the government of Guyana paralyzed the entire world. Jim Jones had forced the entire population to ingest a lethal dose of cyanide mixed with flavoring. The total death toll as reported by the army was 909 people. Among them, more than 300 children. The Jonestown Massacre dominated headlines and news broadcasts internationally. In the time between the airport shooting and the arrival of the army, Jones, who was also found dead, had orchestrated the largest known collective suicide. A few days later, the few survivors of the tragedy, who managed to escape and hide in the jungle, arrived at JFK International Airport in New York. Deeply traumatized by what they had witnessed, having just lost loved ones, partners and even children. They were escorted by FBI agents for questioning. They had to uncover the story behind Jonestown, dive into the depths of that cult, into the mind of its leader, and into the darkness of the people's temple. Travel to that promised land and the hell created by Jim Jones. When the world began to plunge into the darkness of a new conflict, when a man set ablaze the pillars of civilization and the flame of World War II spread, there was a boy who, far from fearing, became fascinated by how a single person could capture the attention of thousands, be heard like a god and command people to fulfill his will. That boy's name was Jim Jones. Raised in a rural town in Indiana, from a very early age, Jim felt that he didn't fit into the world. Only in the church, a place to escape from the life around him, did he find peace and refuge. But it was precisely there that he began to see that the pastor, that person who spoke and was listened to by an entire audience, was the closest thing to the power of the man who fascinated him. In the church and in the footage of Adolf Hitler, he had found a path from which he would never deviate. Throughout his youth, he studied the behavior of hundreds of preachers, taking teachings from all kinds of seemingly unrelated religions to establish the foundations of the faith he wanted to profess. And with that, at the age of just 25, he founded his own church in Indianapolis, a religious community that for the first time in the city's history welcomed both white and black people. Everyone, regardless of their skin color, could find a home in what Jim had baptized as the People's Temple. Tired of the Jim Crow laws, which advocated racial segregation in all public facilities in the country by mandate, and under the slogan of separate but equal, African Americans found in Jim's church a glimmer of hope. A glimpse into a fairer future, seeing their reverend as a symbol, a hero. However, Jones was not committed to any faith beyond the thirst for power. And as soon as he felt that the city was becoming too small for him, that he wouldn't become that globally renowned figure in Indiana, he didn't hesitate to use fear to convince his followers to embark on a first exodus. Declaring himself a prophet, in his sermons, he began to talk about the threat of nuclear war claiming that in his visions he had seen Indiana being devastated by a weapon of mass destruction. 
Only by fleeing, following him to a safe place to start over, could they find salvation. And thus, with thunderous applause, Jim Jones had become what he had always dreamed of, a god capable of mobilizing the masses. He had the power to control people solely with his word. Shadows began to loom over the people's temple. In this way, in July 1965, Jim Jones and the then 140 members of his church left their lives behind and moved to Redwood Valley, a small town in California. Building a church as the headquarters of his community and using his charisma, Jones attracted a large number of people, to the point that within months memberships tripled. He was raising his own kingdom, an empire of faith that he ruled at will, and professing that only communism could make them free, he urged all his followers to part with their possessions. Only then, when they had nothing but faith in their leader, could he control them completely. And he ordered that from that moment on, they should refer to him as the Father. Coercive practices, threats in the face of insinuations of leaving the community, magical healings or beatings for those considered traitors, Everything was part of his plan. The one he considered his destiny to become God. Desperate to attract more members who would bring with them the large sums of money he craved, in 1972, he embarked on a nationwide tour. Like apostles, his followers traveled across dozens of states to communicate the teachings of a leader who would lead them to the Promised Land selling Jim Jones merchandise and recounting the wonders of his healings. The expeditions had the desired impact because that same year, he could fulfill his dream. Mobilizing his community again to settle in the place where his ambitions would materialize. The People's Temple established its main headquarters in San Francisco. And from that moment on, everything escalated. Money, fame, and notoriety. Every day he became more powerful. But at the same time, he was aware that he needed an escape route, a place to flee when the day came, when the law stood in his way. He had to materialize the promised land he had sworn to his followers. The construction of Jonestown in Guyana had begun. Months later, rumors reached Jones that Marshall Kilduff was writing an article about the community. Aware that this could be the end of his public life, he made sure to retain those who followed him. He alerted his followers that soon a journalist would publish an article full of lies. That those who had left the temple were defaming his church and father. It was all part of a conspiracy, not against him, but against them against the members of a community that wanted to live free. And finally, when on August 1st, 1977, Marshall published the report and the media earthquake shook the city, he saw that the time had come. No one was going to collapse his church to snatch the power of his empire. Everyone had to fulfill their destiny, complete the exodus to the promised land. All his followers received instructions to deposit all their savings into the church's accounts and later receive passports to leave the country legally. Over the months, in small groups to avoid attracting the attention of the media they claimed were pursuing them, hundreds of people arrived in Georgetown, the capital of Guyana. Once there, 250 kilometers of dense jungle separated them from their new home. A plane journey or a 19-hour journey through a river to reach Jonestown, the kingdom of their god. A city erected in the middle of nowhere, isolated from the world. Equipped with everything they could need, life in Jonestown worked for a while. But quickly, everything began to wobble. About 1,000 people were living in a place designed to accommodate less than half. Food was sustainably scarce, and working days bordered on exploitation. Many began to feel that they were not in that supposed promised land. They were trapped in a concentration camp. 
with no money or passports to return home, surrounded by an infinite jungle. And although Jim Jones believed he had everything under control, in September he received a notice from the Guyanese authorities. From the United States, an order of repatriation for John Victor, one of the children of the village, had arrived. His mother demanded custody. He had six days to deliver him to Georgetown Airport. Faced with this situation, Jones addressed the community, saying that the government was going after their children, that they wanted to take them away, and that they had to stay strong, more united than ever, that he would solve it, and that no one, as long as he remained alive, would leave the promised land. With significant political and economic influence in Guyana, Jones had won the sympathy and protection of the local government, and had no trouble personally contacting Forbes Burnham, the country's prime minister. Jones told him that the case of the child was nothing more than religious persecution of his community, that the child would be in danger if he returned to the United States. His words had the desired effect because that same day, the Guyanese government dropped all charges. He felt that in his kingdom, far from a world that wanted to take away his power, he was untouchable. The situation in Jonestown was becoming increasingly desperate, but his god remained strong. But in the midst of what was a utopia for him, on November 14, 1978, more than a year after arrival, Jones received another call from Georgetown. A congressman had landed in the capital with an entire expedition requesting access to the village to ensure the health of his American citizens. Jones's refusal was immediate, but his most trusted people warned him that blocking their arrival would only raise suspicions. They could prepare an idyllic scenario so that after this visit no one would bother them again. Thus, after alerting the masses that CIA agents were going to enter the village as part of the conspiracy, and that they should show at all times how happy they were in their promised land. Three days later, on Friday, November 17th, Jones agreed to the American delegation traveling to Jonestown. Strangers had entered his empire, threatening the integrity of everything he had created. The pillar of us and them was about to collapse, but he had to endure. Hours of uncertainty in exchange for an eternity reigning in the minds of his apostles. But with the morning light, all his worst fears began to come true. Someone, one of the followers who had sworn loyalty to him, had asked those outsiders to return home. And after him, one by one, dozens of people approached him asking for forgiveness, lamenting that despite having been happy in Jonestown, they wanted to return home to their families. Anger was growing inside him. They had taken away his power. All the divinity he promised to contain had turned into uncontrollable fury towards everyone around him. He had lost the control he so desired, and at that moment, only revenge could bring him peace. Ten minutes after the delegation, along with the traders who had renounced faith in their god, left Jonestown for the airport, Jones ordered eight men to go meet them. with a very clear order to leave no one alive. The seed of the Jonestown Massacre had just sprouted. A few hours later, when the tractor returned to the village confirming that they had followed his orders, Jones spoke over the loudspeaker. Each and every citizen of his kingdom was summoned to the pavilion of Jonestown. He was perfectly aware that it was the end. Everything had collapsed and there was only one way to be eternal in history. As his followers gather around the shed, Jones steps onto the stage, ready to give a speech that, at his explicit request, begins to be recorded on an audio tape. How very much I've loved you. How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. But in spite of all of that I've tried, a handful of our people, with their lives, 
have made our life impossible. There's no way to detach ourselves from what's happened today. And we, we are sitting here waiting on a powder keg. I don't think this is what we want to do with our babies. I don't think that's what we had in mind to do with our babies. It was said by the greatest of prophets from time immemorial, no man lay, takes my life from me, I lay my life down. If we can't live in peace, then let us die in peace. Before all those who have followed him to the ends of the earth, Jones confesses to having murdered the congressman, his team, and the deserters who betrayed his father. But now there was no turning back. It was a matter of hours before the news reached the United States, and immediately the army would invade their promised land, annihilating them all mercilessly. His freedom had ended, and without it, life no longer made sense. If they wanted to be remembered forever, if they wanted their message to endure for all eternity, they could only do one thing. A final revolutionary act so that the world would understand the greatness of the people's temple. A collective suicide. Barrels filled with a mixture of cyanide and Kool-Aid begin to arrive at the pavilion, guarded by armed men. At that moment, knowing that no one would want to keep living after doing it, Jones ordered the parents to give the liquid first to their children. To have mercy on them and let them rest. Leave a world in which they should not grow up. In a matter of minutes, 300 children have received a lethal dose of cyanide. And when the last one has taken the poison, then it is the turn of the adults. Parents who had just murdered their own children threatened by the man who had promised them a better life. Amid the screams of terror and pain of the children, slowly suffocating from cyanide that prevents their blood from absorbing oxygen, adults line up to receive their dose. Death was already their only fate. Either they took that brew, or they were massacred by the gods. We'll have no choice. Now we have some choice. You think they're going to allow this to be done and allow us to get by with this? it? Must be insane. The children, it's just something to put you to rest. Oh God. Mother, 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 please. Mother, please, please, please. Don't, don't do this. Don't do this. Get down your life with your child, but don't do this. Free at last. Peace. Keep your emotions down. Keep your emotions down. Children, it will not hurt if you be if you be quiet. If you be quiet. We used to think this world, this world's not our home. Well, it sure isn't. As we were saying, it sure wasn't. Who hmm. doesn't want to tell him? All he's doing, if they will tell him, assure these children. Can some people assure these children? of the relaxation of stepping over to the next plane. We've set an example for others. We've set 1,000 people who say we don't like the way the world is. Take our life from us. We laid it down. We got tired. We didn't commit suicide. We committed an act of revolutionary suicide protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. One by one, hundreds of people pronounce their death sentence. Hell is expanding in their promised land. The cries of despair gradually diminish. 
until finally when the breath of the last human being fades away. Everything goes dark forever. Jim Jones has perpetrated the greatest mass murder in history. The echoes of the massacre take hold of the entire world and the silence of Jonestown. This is a Channel 7 News Scene special report with our continuing coverage of the People's Temple story and the murder of Congressman Leo Ryan. Now with the latest details, Van Amberg and Marsha Brandwin. Good evening, here's what's happening. We're interrupting our special broadcasting to bring you this special report, um, a new C news break on the People's Temple mass suicides in Guyana and the murder of Congressman Leo Ryan. I would mention to you now, tonight's movie will run in its entirety immediately following this special report. I also have to warn you as we begin this special report that what you're about to see almost defies description, and some of you may not want to watch it. As soon as these pictures from Jonestown cleared our newsroom, everybody, even a lot of hardened news people, reacted in horror and disbelief. The word on everybody's lips was shades of Auschwitz. These are the first pictures out of Guyana on the incredible orgy of death that took place in the People's Temple Agricultural Mission at Jonestown. 